The Football Show on Off The Ball. With Sky. Watch every live Premier League game this season on Sky Sports, BT Sport and Premier Sports. I'm prepared to end it and I can't. Well, do it then. Again. Do it then. What about your start to the game? I was, it wasn't bad, was it? <laughs> Why should it be an honest answer be a mistake? How can a modern day manager not have a mobile phone? Why should he? Oh. Welcome along to the football show here on Off the Ball. A little bit later on, we're going to be talking to Miguel Delaney, who was at Old Trafford last evening for Manchester United's 2 1 victory against Liverpool. We'll also be looking at some of the moves that could potentially happen in the transfer window between now and the deadline shutting at the end of next week. But delighted to say to kick off the football show, which is brought to you by Sky, where you can watch over 400 games this season from the Premier League, the Women's Super League, the Scottish Premiership, and EFL live on Sky Sports. We've got Republic of Ireland legend and, of course, friend of the show. Kevin Kilbam with us. Kev, how are you getting on? I'm good, Will. How's things? Yeah, it's good to hear from you. Um, generally, I yeah, kind of... I know. It's been a long time, eh? Hey? Yeah, it's been a while since we've had a chat. I'm kind of follow along on social media and uh, generally see the clips every now and again uh, popping up with you talking about Canada going to the World Cup and uh, Major League <laughs> Soccer at the moment. And hey, Look, it's not a bad time to be following Toronto, Kev. I see Insigne has gone to Toronto. Yeah, Insigne and Bernadeschi, um, uh, Cristiano as well, who um, obviously has had a, a good career in Italy and, uh, and Russia for a while as well. So they signed the three Italian boys through the, through this window, and they're in they're in a bit of trouble actually. Will they're in a bit of trouble? Probably still in a bit of trouble now. It's a bad defeat at the weekend. They've pretty much got to win or take points out of every game now to the end of the season to make the playoffs. But it, it's definitely exciting. I don't know if anyone's seen some of the goals that have been scored over the last few weeks by uh, by Toronto. There's been some special goals particularly last weekend from Insigne himself with the, with the beauty, yeah. There's always been a bit of an Italian connection with the city of Toronto, just with immigration into the city, but how come these Italian European Championship winners are going to Toronto now? Well, I, I believe um, Toronto's, uh, outside Italy, they have the biggest population outside uh, New York. I think it's the second biggest uh, population outside New York um, of, of, em- of immigration, so... That probably says it all. There's, there's a huge Italian community here in, in Toronto, and that's probably something that entices the Italian players here. But um, I think, I think fundamentally, ultimately, it was the money that was that was thrown at uh, particularly Bernadeschi. I think that deal went through last January, and the, the numbers. I think he's the highest played, paid player ever in, in the MLS. Um, to get him here was something. It was a real coup for for TFC to get him here first and foremost. Of the wages, of course, and then they signed Bernadeschi out of. Um, out of Juve, his contract had run out. Uh, so to get him in as well, those two have made a huge difference to the side. And I think they're bringing the best out of one or two other players that surround them as well. So it's uh, there's a long way to go, but the, the connection here, certainly with Italy, is uh, is, is huge, yeah. Mm, and Giovincio was there previously as well. We'll talk about the Premier League in a bit, but a yeah. um, few kind of Major League Soccer bits that jumped to mind straight away. Wayne Rooney's gone back to DC United to manage them. And yeah. Just take a look at the results. The results haven't been good. That's partly why there was a change in management and Rooney's going in. It looks like DC United probably won't make the playoffs, but what would kind of be expected of Rooney and now that he's gone back into the league again? Mm. Yeah, it is unlikely. At the bottom of the table, Will, there's probably no chance of making the playoffs at this stage, but it's about building towards next season now. And uh, what I've noticed here, there can be a dramatic turnaround in, in only a few months. I, I, I think outside some of the, uh, the, the, the DPs, the designated players there is a, a huge gulf between real quality and maybe the lesser players within the league. So if you sign a couple of DPs that can bring one or two of the, I'd say, mid-run players along with you, pretty much what, what TFC have done now, they, they've got a real buzz around the city. They've got these two big players that they've got in and, and they're getting huge gates. DC probably need to do something similar. Obviously, Ben techie has gone in there now as well. Uh, it'll be about next season, Will. That's pretty much what it'll be about for Rooney. They need to probably start well next season because I think the, the one thing I've noticed when when I'm following uh, the MLS, the season starts. There's a there's a, a big you know fanfare around the start of the league, and then well, the season starts in March. Well, usually what it would start in March, February, March time. Through May, June, and July, it's a quiet month. And in fairness, a lot of the games become meaningless. And it was something Zlatan Ibrahimovic said when he was here. A lot of the games do become meaningless because obviously there's no relegation. It's about making the playoffs. You're going to run towards the end of the season and win five out of your last seven games, or some, you know, get going a great run. You make the playoffs, and that's what it's all about: making the playoffs for a lot of these teams. So, Rooney's got a big overhaul to do. They've sold one or two players, they've brought one or two in, but it will be about next season, about building towards a great start for him personally, maintaining through those summer months, and then towards the back end of the season in the autumn to get uh, to get into the playoffs. 
Were you surprised to see Rooney take that as his next step? Because he got plenty of praise, Kev, for what he was doing at Derby under like horrific circumstances because of the finances yeah. and you know, players not getting their wages. And I think he even helped out with the wages um, for a couple of the weeks at the end of last season. But Rooney generally came out of that job with Derby with a little bit of credit. And he could potentially yeah. have gone to work elsewhere, particularly in the Championship or within the Football League, decided to go back over to America. Were you surprised he made that move as his next uh, managerial post? Uh, not really, actually, no. I think he can probably concentrate now fully on his uh, on his own coaching style, away from maybe a little bit of scrutiny. There's always going to be scrutiny because it's Wayne Rooney and, and there'll be a lot more people that will be following DC United because Wayne Rooney is there. But I know that Wayne has come over to try to develop his own coaching uh, skills, his own coaching techniques, develop himself uh, in, in every aspect of that. So I think he'll probably get a little bit more time here to develop that. And I think that's probably the most important thing. You mentioned there maybe one or two options maybe in England. He immediately ruled himself out of that Everton job before Lampard took over. There was probably one or two more jobs that he could have taken, but it still would have been at championship level where there would have been huge pressure to succeed immediately. I think at DC, I think he gets a little bit more time. I think that helps him develop more. I think that's probably the reason why he has actually taken that job, Will. Your old club Everton at the weekend got what will probably feel like an important point against Nottingham Forest. Uh, was watching the game on the TV, very late game, very late goal, even from Damari Gray uh, to yeah. rescue a point. But the point was probably badly needed after the start that Everton had had to the season. Yeah, well, he was getting to the stage where like, I watched the full game. I was getting to the stage, you know, once you were getting to the last 20, 30 minutes of the game before Forrest had scored, it, it, it was seeming a bit desperate, like, you know, this is a big, this this could be a big game for Everton come the end of the season. That's the way it was seeming to me. And then Forrest score, and you're thinking, this could be dire now because there'll be huge pressure going into the uh, in, into the next couple of weeks, particularly with the window not shut, Lampard under pressure to sign players and obviously getting results off the back of that. It was a big point in the end, a huge point, because now, you know, as I said, it's almost as if the rivals now are Forest this season. The rivals are are going to be some of the teams that's going to be at the bottom. They've got to try and break themselves away from that. There's a lot of pressure on Lampard, and and I spoke about it on the on the show with you guys at the end of the season. Uh, listening to Michael Keane, listening to um, who was who was the other guy who was being interviewed as well. I can't remember now off the top of my head. There was one or two of the Everton players talking about the pressure of being in the position that they were in last season. And in all honesty, not much has changed. If anything, they've had to sell a couple of the best players. Is Anthony Gordon going to be allowed to leave? That potentially could happen in the next couple of weeks. So these results now are no-lose no games immediately. And, and I felt as though it was a big point for Everton now just going forward because there's going to be a few uh, tough, tough days ahead. The games that I saw, I watched Chelsea and I watched Forest and... I have to say, Will, there's not an awful lot that's been created in those games, like chances, clear chances in, in those matches. Even against Forrest, Forrest was solid at the weekend. They had a back four fairly much intact throughout the game and didn't want to give too much away. And, and Everton are going to struggle to break that, that type of team down because, I, I mean, I wouldn't even say, I was going to say they're without Calvert-Lewin, but even with Calvert-Lewin, they, they failed to really open up sides recently. So they need, they need somebody that's going to be the difference maker and, and that's going to be the difficulty if Gordon were to leave because he can give them that bit of spark and, and does give them something a little bit different. Yeah, because like even last season when Everton were getting pulled into trouble, you were thinking Richarlison is there to get them enough goals yeah. to probably keep them up and uh, Gordon was starting to emerge a little bit and then Cavaloon got injured but still Richarlison was there to score. Now he's gone, understandably, big bid for him. I wonder, Kev, as well, when it comes to Gordon, if it goes to fifty, sixty million pounds, it's going to be very difficult for Everton to turn that down. Yeah, and particularly with the financial situation that they're in as well, they, they, you know, needs must have had to sell Richarlison in the summer. I don't think many Evertonians wanted to see him go, but that could be the case again with Gordon. It might be a case of building up off the back of that sale. That's the way it might be. There's going to be a lot of pressure really on Damari Gray as well, who scored the goal at the weekend. I really like the Mari Gray, first of all, when I saw him at Birmingham. And I've said this before, I saw him at Birmingham, saw him obviously at Leicester and saw the development in his career. But he's he's been blighted by total inconsistencies. He, he, he's not able to pull it all together a lot when he's, when he's been starting matches. So there'll be a lot of pressure on maybe the Mari Gray this year, maybe even when Townsend, when he gets fit as well, to, to be that creative spark within the side because they, they need something different. Um, I saw they were trying to sign... Or well, they have been trying to sign. Um, who's the guy from Watford? Will I can't think of his name off the top of my head now. Um, that Newcastle have been in for. So they, potentially they could be getting uh, they could be getting him in. 
Uh, and that will actually relieve a little bit of pressure on Calvert-Lewin when he does get fit. But it, it is about maybe trying to get that little bit more of a creative spark within the side because they, they've, they've seriously lacked in the games that I've seen at Everton play this season. Yeah, Joe Pedro, the player at Watford, who Newcastle have been in Joe for Pedro, as well. That's it. Um, yeah. It's going to probably be difficult to keep up with Newcastle's financial muscle, but maybe it yeah, might be possible... True, yeah if Gordon goes to Chelsea and then that frees yeah. up some funds to potentially sign him but um, Demary Gray's pace is going to be so important though Kev as you mentioned because I thought against Aston Villa particularly Everton played remarkably deep and are now playing the three yeah. centre-backs and even their wing-backs were playing very defensively that day so the best chance they had of carrying a threat was actually getting the ball up to him and letting him be direct and they're going to need that pace if they're going to carry something on the counter mm. this season yeah, I mean, I actually didn't see a, a lot of the Villa game. I saw, I, I saw all the highlights from it, but I didn't. I suffered it for you. Start to finish. Did you? Did you? Well, did. There you go. There you uh, go. But it was right very early your though. time. It was an early Saturday kickoff the week before, so I can understand if you were still in bed. Yeah, I'm, I'm normally up for the seven thirty games. I like, the, I like the early kickoffs. I, I, I normally get them, but I didn't get it uh, last weekend. Unfortunately, I missed, I missed out on it. But. I think what you're saying there is right. I think if Everton are going to play that way and sit in deep, we, we, we saw United playing that way to an extent last night. You know, if, if you're going to play against sides that's going to have more possession than you, you're going to have to sit in deep. It's how you break against sides. And you've got to have ball carriers, which Damari Gray is. You've got to have pace, of course, which Damari Gray uh, possesses as well. Obviously, Calvert-Lewin, he's got pace. He's got aerial ability as well and, and the ability to hold up, hold the ball up. But Gordon's another one as well that, that we speak about who's a ball carrier. He's, he's maybe a little bit of, still a bit of unpredictability about him. But these are the type of players that you need if you're going to sit in Tarkovsky and, um, uh, who, sorry, who's the other centre half, whether it's Mina, whether it's Keane, whether it's, uh, who's the other centre half, Will? I'm trying to think of the top of my head here now. I have a few uh, options. And Keane was on the bench for the, the first two games. I used yeah, to work his way back into who, the team. Who, but. Whoever, they're whoever they're going to play, certainly Tarkovsky is used to playing in a Burnley side that sit in as a back four. They don't, they don't get out too much. You know, it's about sitting in as a tight back four and trying to break from those positions. So, if, you, if you're going to play like that, you need ball carriers. And that's maybe if they were to let Gordon go, that would be my only issue with that that sale. They've not got another ball carrier in the side that's going to be able to get them up the pitch quickly. Mm, slow start for Everton. Slow start for the red half of Liverpool too. Um, I thought, despite what Jurgen Klopp said after the game about if there'd been a few more minutes, Liverpool would have got an equaliser and he felt maybe even on the balance of play, Liverpool could have won. I actually thought watching the game that Manchester United looked pretty comfortable winners last night. Before the last 15, 20 minutes, you, you, as soon as Salah gets the goal, there was a bit of panic setting, wasn't there? But I, I think, although Liverpool, what was it, 70% possession that they had of the ball and they, they had more shots at goal than, than United, I think, uh, throughout, it was still, I felt, a comfortable enough win for United. And much, as much as I say that, it's, you know, sometimes when you don't have the ball, I always feel you can control a game even though you don't, you, you're not, you've not got a, a vast majority of possession. I, I do feel that you can actually control a game. And I think United did that last night. I think the back four tucked in nice and narrow. I think as a back four, it's probably as good as, as I've seen United in a long time. I think that's something that's been mentioned. Um, you know, I, I've listened to uh, you guys this morning on uh, on OTBAM and listened to what the guys are saying about as a back four, United were, were excellent. And I think the organised, particularly with, um, with Varane and Martinez last night. I think we really saw how that partnership's going to work. But, but Liverpool overall, they could, they could have nicked something in the last 15, 20 minutes, though. Well, I think that they pushed on and they looked to me like if anyone was going to score late on, it was going to be Liverpool with the way that Man United were playing. But I think for 70 minutes of that game, I think United will be fairly happy that it can be a template they can use to go forward, yeah. Manchester United decided, Kev, to drop both Maguire and Cristiano. Cristiano came on for a bit of a cameo towards the end of the game and blasted yeah. a shot into the Stratford end was about all he did after he came on. But I wonder, is this going to be a case that those two guys are going to be on the bench from now on or whether he's tempted to bring them back in? Like Maguire particularly is probably going to find it difficult to get back into the side now. Yeah, I, I think so. Um, I, I'm still, I, I was listening to, uh, well, I saw it online, stuff that uh, that Jamie Carragher was saying about, about Martinez and how teams are going to target him. I think last night was the perfect game for him, but he was able to sit in. He didn't need, necessarily need to step in. And Liverpool weren't weren't going direct that we saw like we saw Brentford doing or we saw Brighton doing at times. I think I think he's still going to have issues, Martinez. I do think that, but I I still feel he has to be a better option than, than Harry Maguire. Harry Maguire simply has to come out of that side simply with, with the pressure that's been on him as well and has been mounting. Whether or not United can can sell him before the window closes, I, I'm not too sure. 
Cristiano Ronaldo, I, I mean, you, you, I know you mentioned him there, Will, but it, it just seems to me United have just got to pay him up. If, if they want him out the door, he's not going to move. He's not going to go quietly. Just pay him up. They're paying over the odds on transfer fees. It seems everyone that goes into the club by 20 and 30 million, that's probably about the amount they're going to have to pay uh, Ronaldo up to go. If they're going to get rid of him, that seems to be the, the only viable option, I think. Pay him up. Make make Ronaldo a free, and then there will be there'll be suitors around Europe to take him. But um, just going back to the partnership of Varane and um, and Martinez, I think it, it was it was excellent. It's probably Varane's best performance in a United shirt. I would feel that was last night. Um, but it, it's not going to be Liverpool. We're going to test them now. This is the thing we've we've seen in the last two games again. Or prior to that, with Brighton and and uh, and uh, Brentford targeted the back four with pace with with direct running in behind with direct balls played and this is where United are going to struggle when they've got a majority of the ball and this that that performance last night was almost like Solskjaer in his early days when the the they were giving up possession they were playing on the counter and they looked great I I actually like teams playing like that I really like like it. certainly Man United historically have, have, have always played that sort of counter-attacking play They've always sat in quite narrow as a back four. They've been solid, but they've had pace, to ball carriers, runners in behind. I don't think Ten Hag is going to play like that. And I think if they do play open against certain sides, I don't think McTominay is going to be the answer alongside Casemiro. I don't think that because I think if you're going to put all the pressure on Casemiro to do that job as, as a holding role in the middle of the park with, Casim- with, with Fred or with McTominay, whoever's going to be beside him, I don't think they're good enough to do that. So... It might be a bit of a, as I said before, a template to go forward for United. Just being narrow as a back four and try to utilise that pace that you've got within the side with Alanga, with Rashford or Martial. He was he was excellent at times last night as well and has been excellent this season. So it might be the time that they can actually sit in a little bit and, and use last night as a way to go forward. Flip side to all of that, looking at the Liverpool performance, Midfield didn't function really. Um, Henderson and Milner struggled to get around with the energy that United had around the middle of the park. Yeah. Their fullbacks were penned back quite a bit. Trent Alexander Arnold had a very difficult night with Alanga, particularly in the first half. And then something that's very different, Kev, to what they did before. Sadio Mane wasn't there to make those runs in behind. Salah was having to come deep to get the ball quite a bit. And it's just naturally with Firmino as well. He's not going to go in behind the two central defenders. In a way, it made it much easier for Manchester United to defend in the way they did last night because of how different Liverpool were to the Liverpool teams of the last few seasons. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree with that. Sadio Mane is a huge loss for them with what he gave them. And you mentioned there Firmino. Firmino never really ran in, in behind defences. What he gave them, he gave them a platform to build off. And in general, would drop deep. And you, you constantly saw those diagonal runs from out to in from Salah and Mane. And that was the template of how Liverpool played. And if, if they did that last night, I think they would have put, you know, or, or played that type of football, as I spoke about with Brentford and Brighton. Being a little bit more direct, that's going to hurt United because they're going to struggle. Whereas I think they give them a bit of an easy ride. I think for all that, um, Malassia was excellent up against Salah. I thought, I thought he enjoyed his defensive role right up against him. But as you say, when Salah was dropping deep, it was easier for him to go in. And because he knew there was no one that was going to go in behind him, Milner wasn't really going to make that run from deep, and neither was Henderson into the into the right channel. So it was easy for him in, in that respect. Don't get me wrong, he's still up against a world-class player and he's got to do that job, and I thought he was excellent at just doing that defensive role. But losing Mane, as, it, it, that is such a huge loss of Liverpool. And we knew it was going to be that way. Diaz is not the sort of player that's going to continuously run in behind He's not going to be that type that's going to come from in to out consistently. He's a, such a goal threat. Um, probably technically he might be better than Mane. That's the way that, that I would see it. But he doesn't carry the threat continuously for 90 minutes that, that Mane carried. And that's that's the difference, I feel, when, when you don't have him in the team. They'll get to a point. Darwin Nunes will be back from his suspension in a couple of games. These injuries yeah. will go away. To be missing seven first-team players. He's another one, sorry, Will. Just with Nunes last night, the physicality that he would have given them up against the, the, those two centre-halves that enjoyed that battle last night. I think that would have been a different battle if he would have played last night. But again, it's all lifts and books, isn't it? Yeah, no, definitely. But you looked across their bench and with the exception of, bring, of being able to bring on young Carvalho to come in to make a bit of a difference, they didn't have great options on the bench because of the injuries they have currently. How concerning is the start for Liverpool or do we expect that when they get those players back, it's just going to get back more towards where they've been in recent seasons? I, I think the most concerning part for Liverpool, particularly last night, was the, how they were, they were outrunning the game. I, I, I think I read somewhere that United 
had almost double the amount of sprints than Liverpool, or certainly a vast majority more more uh, more sprints than Liverpool all over the pitch, covering more ground. That's so unlike Liverpool. Liverpool outrun teams. They're able to 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 drive over the top of them just with the physical attributes that a lot of those players have. And we we never saw that last night from Liverpool. So that will come. Klopp will get them right in that respect. It might just take a few weeks before we start to see that type of thing clicking, fitness levels rise and and they start to get a bit more comfortable. But there's, there's been a bit of an overhaul. There's been a lot of change in the last year, hasn't there? Certainly up front, the three that we we had Liverpool down as every, excuse me, every single week, Firmino, Salah, Mane. Firmino's going to be a player that's going to be a bit in and out this season. Losing Mane, Diaz is still settling. Um, they don't have Jota at the moment as well, who made a huge difference to Liverpool, uh, huge difference to Liverpool last season. So those injuries, as you, as you say, once they get back, Liverpool will be OK. But as we've seen in recent seasons, the league could be beyond them. They could be chasing, you know, after the World Cup, the, the World Cup's going to be a huge distraction for a lot of players. And it's going to be a killer for the Premier League clubs. And when they get back after the World Cup, when you're into January and February and beyond that, we may see the best of Liverpool then. But ultimately, it may be too little too late because we've seen in recent seasons that when you're playing catch-up against the likes of City, they're not going to drop too many points. Most impressive win of the weekend, in many ways, was Leeds against Chelsea. Yeah. Uh, Chelsea are blunt up front, and they're going to probably have to bring someone in. And maybe Aubameyang as the player is going to be signed as their new number nine. But Leeds, hell of a start to the season. You know, after Jesse Marsh yeah. just kind of steadied the ship, and there were plenty of question marks about Jesse Marsh when he came in because naturally, I think Leeds supporters were very attached to Bielsa for everything that had happened yeah. and kind of the you know the joy of getting out of the championship with them. And there were plenty of question marks about Jesse Marsh coming in. But Leeds have started this season pretty well. No, in, incredibly well. Well, I, I really enjoyed watching them. I, I, I against Chelsea, and I've enjoyed watching them. And as you say, the the, the task of replacing Bielsa was, was huge. Um, so, I mean, you'd probably say he's he's Leeds most um, most admired manager probably since Don Revy. Certainly, I, I, that's the way it seems to me. And he, he, Leeds fans put him right up there with with Don Revy. So. I think for Jesse Marsh to come in and replace him and, and the task that he's got, it, that's uh, it's no mean feat and it's going to be difficult for him to, to get that consistency that Bielsa had for such a long time. But I think there was a lot of negativity around him simply because of his accent as well, Will. That, that's the thing, you know, there, there was a bit, a bit of a laughing stock around Bob Bradley when he went into Swansea a few years ago. I think um, Armas, the assistant manager that was at United, there was a little bit of negativity around him. I think that was within their own camp many suggesting that he's, he, he was Ted Lasso and things like this. But I think, you know, you're judging someone by an accent. It, it, it's wrong. You're judging someone by how they look. I know it's, it's, it's absolutely wrong. And I think that was the feeling. And I, I get the feeling as well. There's certainly within scouting networks, there's, there's, a, there's ill feeling towards North American players, much as the same would be across many leagues. I think there's a feeling towards Irish players as well. There's a negative feeling around our Irish players that are technically, technically not up to it. And I think certainly when you see uh, Brendan Aronson and um, and Tyler Adams, Tyler Adams will he's someone that I've admired for a really long time. Particularly when I've watched the qualification for, for the World Cup, seen him play for the US in the midfield. He is the main player for the US. I know they've got Pulisic, who you know gives them the creative spark, and Aronson that gives them the energy in the side. But Tyler Adams is the player that really makes them tick, and I think he'll be certainly one to watch across the Premier League season into the World Cup. But for Lee's to be able to sign him, and I think he's gone under the radar a bit playing at, at Leipzig. M- many people won't really uh, have, have known too much of him, but what a player he, I, I think he will become. I think he holds his position really well. I think he's a player that controls the ball really well, takes it in tight areas, gets his team out of trouble, and also has that high, high energy around him. And I think, I, I mean, I was down at the MLS All-Star game um, a couple of weeks ago, Will, and uh, it was down in Minnesota or in, uh, in Minneapolis. I was talking to Adrian Heath, who's um, uh, Minnesota's coach, and he, he was telling me about the amount of players that he's put in to, uh, to English clubs, particularly six or seven English clubs that he would have regular contact with, who's turned the nose up uh, Alfonso Davies. Alfonso Davies was going to go to, or was, could have gone to actually a championship club now, and they said he's not good enough. I mean, Alfonso Davies now is worth probably 100, 150 million. There's no better fullback in the world than Davies. And I think that's the feeling towards North American players. And I think, as I said before, that's the feeling towards Irish players as well. There's that snobbishness almost that they're not good enough before they've really had a chance to review and have a look at them. And I think Adams now and Aronson are proving that players are good enough to, to play in the Premier League with that high energy approach, with that. 
um, technical ability, of course, that they have. And I think they'll make a difference for Leeds this season. And I think Jesse Marsh deserves a lot of credit. I know it's only early days, but watching them at the weekend, the energy that they played with, and it's so exciting to watch. I, I thought it was a brilliant game to watch. I thought Chelsea contributed to it as well early on. But once Leeds got the second goal, it, it, it looked unlikely that, that Chelsea were going to get anything from the game. And I, I, I just, I, I really admire what Leeds have done this season, particularly with the pressure that Marsh and, and the club has been under. Well, Kev, from Jesse Marsh coming in to replace Marcelo Bielsa, what we really want your view on is Kevin McStay coming in to replace James Horn <laughs> as the Mayo manager for next season. Well, he's there for four years. Yeah. It's, a, it's a three plus yeah. one, I think is how uh, Mayo announced it. I mean, obviously, look, Mayo have come up a little bit short, uh, semi-final stage. Um, and then you're looking at the final year before and all the hope there was uh, under Horn and potentially winning in All-Ireland. And then they come up short against Tyrone. What's the hope about yeah. McStay coming in now? Well, well, first of all, I, I want to wish him all the very best. Kevin and his staff, I think, uh, I personally, I think it's a very good appointment. Uh, I know how well thought of he, he is over there in, in Mayo as well with, with everything that he's achieved as well. So I just, I, I think every every Mayo fan, we all we all have hope and maybe it is the hope that, ki- that, that does kill you in the end, but we've got so much talent and maybe it is about building. I'm glad that he's got those at least three years to build from. I think it might be a, a two-year uh, build or, or, over that time. Next season might be the time to get uh, to blood one or two players so so Kevin can have a look at all those players. Uh, and then the year after, what, 2024 20, now, it might be that. That might be the time when we see Mayo having another real crack at an All-Ireland. But I'm, I'm, I'm delighted it's been sorted because it seems to have dragged on for a while. Uh, I think it is the right appointment. I think he, with his experience, with what he brings, he's, he's, you know, he's not won too many fans within the Mayo County Board over the years because of how outspoken he's been. But I think it needs a strong character. It needs somebody that's going to go in there and, and lead uh, and lead that group. The, the talent is still there. The talent will always be produced, and I'm just, I'm hopeful. Will that's the way I look at it. I'm hopeful. You have to be hopeful. That's the way it is as a Mayo fan. Are you saying you didn't enjoy the drama that we were all enjoying, where there was four or five different packages being put together, and we were watching these <laughs> management teams being assembled and then being announced, and who was going to take over? Look, I didn't have the stress of being a Mayo fan during all of it, but I found this no, like, I, I, I like I the X factor. I, I don't enjoy all that. I, I honestly, I'd rather things were done under the radar. Um, and then all of a sudden there's an appointment made. Um, I think due diligence certainly has to be done. I think you have to listen to to everyone with the ideas that they've got on the coaching staff and you know, and everyone that they're looking to bring in with them. But when it's it's done so publicly, I, it, I don't know. It's the, everyone wants everybody wants to laugh at Mayo. That's the thing. Everybody wants to laugh. You can't get away from the fact is of what has been achieved over the last ten years. Yes, it's been. It's been unlucky at times. It's been, you know, it's been poor play at times. It's been bad, you know, bad management of games at times. But for the success and the continued success and the, the days out that I've had following the team, the days out that all supporters have had following the team, I always felt absolute pride in, in the team that was going before us. But it, it, it does seem a bit of a sideshow because people want to mock, want to mock the county board. People want to mock the, the team. People want to mock Mayo in general. And maybe rightly so at times, but uh, I prefer things done under the radar, Will, personally. And I'm just, as I said, I'm just glad that Kevin McStay now has been appointed and and the the whole panel, the whole county can move forward now and hopefully have a, have a big push for all Island over the next couple of years. Well, whatever about some of the presenters here, Kev, you won't find me slagging off the people of Mayo. You could very well... Well, there's one or two others on that show. One or two others on your show do, Will. That's my problem, you know. You've got a couple of those ginger fellas in there that love to mock Mayo. And uh, anyway, I won't, won't mention any names anyway. Well, look, make sure that Owen Sheehan is somewhere to stay if his travels bring him to I Toronto. Didn't, I didn't say one. Owen. Did I, oh, did I say Owen? No, I didn't mention any names. You didn't have to be specific. Uh, he's gone. Owen's a goner anyway, isn't he? You know, he's, I, I, I've not even spoken to Owen yet, but the, I got the shock last week when I when I heard Owen was leaving. You know, he's built himself up. He's built his, all, his whole... Um, the whole persona of, of of him being this great presenter now and everything, and he he just ditches it, walks away into into the sunset. You know, fair play to him. Yeah, shameful. Now, if he does find his way into Canada, I presume you put him up for a night, will you? I can come. He can come and stay with me. Of course, you can. Yeah. yeah. See. I've yeah. already I've already got on somewhere to stay uh, when he goes through Toronto. <laughs> a lovely city and uh, somewhere he should definitely visit along the way. Kev, great to hear you're uh, keeping well and going well. Thanks a million for joining us. Oh, it's good. Thanks, Will. Take it easy, guys. Thank you. Thanks to Kevin Kilbant. We'll be back with Miguel Delaney in just a moment.
Football on Off the Ball. With Sky. Don't miss Southampton versus Man United this Saturday. Live only on BT Sport.